Welcome to the Milo Yiannopoulos Show on Podcast One, broadcasting live from Mordor, the Borg Cube, and Voldemort's Lair all at the same time. This show is hosted by Milo Yiannopoulos, the most fabulous supervillain on the internet. Sorry, no offense, but it's true. The Milo Yiannopoulos Show is brought to you by Breitbart.com. Welcome to the Milo Yiannopoulos Show. I am Tom Sakata, and some of you know me as Milo's sidekick. I'm also the co-host of the Milo Show. Milo's a little bit under the weather this week, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and play the talk from UC Irvine that Milo gave last week about the criminal justice system and immigration reform. It was a great talk. Hundreds of people showed up, and not everybody could get in, so we're going to let you cut the line. And you're going to go right in to the auditorium last week at UC Irvine. And you're going to get to listen to this great lecture that Milo gave last week. We'll be back next week with a great guest. Milo will be, and I will be back right here uh, at this time on Friday next week. So I hope you guys have a great week coming up. Make sure to follow us at The Milo Show on Twitter. And we'll talk to you guys very soon. Well, I'm definitely not getting press secretary after that. <laughs> oh, I've, do you like my penis? <laughs> they, did, they, did so, they did so well. They did so well. Tear, tearing down hurtful stereotypes, one penis gun at a time. <laughs> oh, God. The most ridiculous thing about this outfit is, is it, it's, taken, it's taken Obama, the tranny law, and oh, free speech to get me in polyester. <laughs> okay, no, 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 you have no idea. It's so hot up here. Right, on to the serious bit, and then we're going to have a nice time. Uh, I am Constable Yiannopoulos, <laughs> from the da dangerous faggot precinct. And before I begin, I'd like to read you the new campus Miranda rights. You know what Miranda rights are? You know what they say when you get arrested? I've never heard them, obviously. Um, you have the right to listen and believe. <laughs> Anything you can say or do say or even think will be used against you in a campus kangaroo court. <laughs> you have the right to a useless gender or race studies degree for which, we for which we will make you pay for the rest of your life and possibly sting the taxpayer too. And if you can't afford one, well, somebody else will pick up the check. <laughs> you have the right to accept the blame for everything, especially if you're white and male. <laughs> Not the first time I've had something like this pokey in my face this morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that. I'll speak directly into it. Yes, it reminds me of home. Right. Actually, actually, this reminds me of home. <laughs> that could get tiring after all. Huh? I promise I'm going to get through some good stuff. Okay. Now, you're in luck. I'm not truly the PC police. I am, as I said, Constable Milo, the dangerous faggot police. It's my pleasure to be here. God. Oh, it's so hot. It's so hot in this polyester. You're hot! <laughs> All right, fine. I'll keep them on. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to hear this evening to explain to you why social justice is cancer. <laughs> Somebody got a mirror? I got no. Okay. Um, Social justice is a very intrusive disease, and I'm going to explain as briefly as I can before we get into Q&A and, and talking to you guys, uh, in the context of law and order and immigration, why social justice is hurting precisely the people that it claims to help. It worms its way in, and before you know it, it starts choking the life out of its host. That's what cancer does. Now, like most American universities, um, social justice has been rotting your school from the inside. Just last year, the student government passed a resolution to ban the display of national flags, including the American flag, in student government offices. Straight out of... Mm -hmm, straight out of... We should sing, shouldn't we? We should sing. They don't like patriotism here. We should sing. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proud Twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous park o'er the ramparts we watched was so gallantly streaming. Star-spangled banner, yeah, 
to that musical interlude, we'll get to the facts. <laughs> I started a bit high there, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Straight out of Central Casting, a fellow named Matthew Guevara, probably related to Che, explained that flags can serve as weapons for nationalism, and that the American flag has been flown in instances of colonialism and imperialism. This Che wannabe, who of course is the council representative from the School of Social Ecology, <laughs> used some very specific social justice buzzwords like a culturally inclusive space and allow everyone to participate equally and confidently. This is social justice cancer in action right here on your campus. Now the facts show that UC Irvine is not too far gone. It's time to save you. That's why I'm here. <laughs> it's not too late because the resolution was vetoed. It's fascinating to see how sensible people are repulsed by the interactions with social justice warriors. For example, the alumni and potential students at Missouri who have spoken with their wallets. Anyone else happened at Missouri? Admissions down 33%, I think. They had to close, well, they had to close two dorms. Now, if you looked at, listen to any more of my talks, you'll know what the, sorry, I'm so hot in this. Um, if, you, if you listen to any of my other talks, you might know, they've had to close two dorms because they've got so few new um, applications. You know what those dorms are called? They're the two things you lose when you indulge in social justice. They are called strength and excellence. <laughs> um, <laughs> they've, uh, they've, uh, they're also alumni donations down, I think, probably at the latest count, about $40 million. Um, good. <laughs> Considering the hundreds of thousands of newly minted Milo fans who witnessed the crazy reception I've had at many schools like DePaul... <laughs> did you see... Did you see the letter today from the president at DePaul? Pract no, well, he practically, uh, he practically alluded to me as a member of the KKK, and although I do look fantastic in white, uh, <laughs> that is about where the similarity ends, although I, I, you know, I prefer to have disgusting things, done, disgusting things done to me by black people. <laughs> for a closer... For a closer-to-home example, consider the Asian population in California. UC Irvine is 56% Asian, 58% Asian, sorry, a group that has traditionally voted Democrat and supported policies like affirmative action. Now social justice has turned against Asians, with many schools discounting Asian test scores for being too high, punishing them because they work too hard, and California, and California threatening to change their own enrollment roles for a more diverse enrollment. Asians have quickly and strongly moved against these measures, which is why I see so many of them in my talks, I think. Um, I need a penis because my throat is a little dry. Does somebody have a penis for me? Does somebody have a penis for me? Can I have that? Does somebody have that for me? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Very disappointing. Excuse me. Mm. 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 Tastes fine. <sighs> Before we dive into a set of facts and statistics that may boggle your mind, it's my duty to read you your Milo-approved Miranda rights. You have the right to controversial opinions and speech. <laughs> you have the right to confront and to disagree with, to rebut, and to question opinions that don't match your own. You have the right to do all of that without being told that you are violating a safe space. You have the right to reject the brainwashing forced upon you by professors that make Obama look like the aforesaid Che Guevara. And most importantly, you have the right to worship your dangerous faggot. Now, I'm not a real policeman, um, but, no, I, mean, I know, I have had some policemen in me. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'll stop. It's cheap, it's cheap, it's cheap. You should stop laughing, it just encourages me. That's not even in here, I'm just... Mm. <laughs> but I do recognize that blue lives matter. Blue lives matter. Black Lives Matter doesn't really care about black lives. Um, it's, as we'll discuss shortly, more of a movement for attention, money, and, like most activism, more money. To achieve, uh, to achieve these goals, they focus their energies on cases of black men killed by the police. Well, the work of criminologist Dr. Richard Johnson of the University of Toledo explains just how futile this is. And some of this stuff is tough to listen to. Some of this stuff is not pleasant. It's not uh, the kind, kind of thing that you want to discuss over cocktails. But it's important to understand the problem if you're going to fix it, 
which Black Lives Matter definitely can't. Based on 2012 numbers, it would take 40 years worth of blacks killed by police to equal the total number of blacks murdered by other blacks in a single year. Less than 400 people a year are killed by cops. 61% of them are white men. 32% are black males. Black men are not killed out of proportion when you consider they're much more likely to interact with police. People are killed by police about as often as they're struck by lightning, but I don't see many protests about storms. Black males, <laughs> black males are 58% of those killed legally by private citizens in self-defense. And you think, aha, we've got you on something. Except 75% of them were killed by other blacks. <laughs> FBI statistics on murder lay bare the real threat to black lives in America, and that is other blacks. Black men are about 6.5% of the U.S. population, but they commit 52% of all murders. That has dipped to about 40% in recent years. Black men overwhelmingly murder other black people, and white people overwhelmingly murder other white people. So just like abuse and harassment on the internet, this isn't really a racial issue like that isn't really a gendered issue. Looking at overall violent crime, blacks are 27% more likely to attack whites than vice versa, and eight times more likely to attack Hispanics. This is the shocking number I hope you take away from my visit. 90% of blacks that die of murder die at the hands of other black people, and that's from the FBI homicide report. 90%. We're not here to talk about why this happens, why 74% of black children are raised without fathers, per Health and Human Services, and why the government seems intent on continuing a cycle of destruction within the black community. My message is simple. Black lives don't matter to Black Lives Matter. If they did, they'd be confronting these issues instead of ignoring them completely. Black Lives Matter tries to turn young men like Michael Brown and Jamal Clark into martyrs, but these guys aren't angels. It reminds me of when the UVA, it reminds me of the UVA rape case. It was feminism's flagship battle in the fight against a supposed rape epidemic on campus. Except, of course, it wasn't true. Neither was the Duke Lacrosse case. Neither was uh, Emma Solkowitz at the University of Columbia, mattress girl. All of these marquee and flagship cases seem to turn out to be hoaxes. The best examples they can come up with, in fact, are hoaxes. And Black Lives Matter's leadership is a disgrace. There's Sean King who isn't even black. <laughs> and, you know, let's, let's see what comes out in the press about all that charity money, but I think we know what's happened to that. DeRay, who's better known for his vest than any actual achievements, and lesser stars like Charles Wade, who was arrested for prostitution and allegedly is also a charity scammer. Now, Chicago is the perfect case study for Black Lives Matter. Chicago, of course, being the home of DePaul. I was out recently and uh, stopped. It's the only, the only event I've ever had to stop. Uh, it's the only thing I've ever had to call short. It's Obama's hometown, because of course it is, uh, run, by, <laughs> run by Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who was Obama's chief of staff and worked in the Clinton White House as well. Chicago is a very gun-unfriendly city. Combined with complete domination of the local government by Democrats, it should be a paradise for black residents, given that guns are banned everywhere, right? I thought that's how it worked. Like, it was a gun crime. You just say, OK, guys, no more guns. And all of the killers and crazies go, oh, all right, no more. <laughs> Gun-free. This, of course, this of course lays bare the, the insanity of the liberal mind. You know, there's a shooting at a school, or there's a shooting at a, at a, at a shopping centre, or a military base, and their answer is less guns, not more, so that people can't protect themselves against crazy people who, of course, if you just simply put up a sign saying, no guns here, please, would obviously listen. <laughs> After my speech at DePaul uh, was shut down by Black Lives Matter, they were quoted in the press saying, I threatened their physical safety and could cause a massacre. <laughs> they, said, they said my words could cause a massacre. Well, the massacre did come to Chicago, but it had nothing to do with me. Over Memorial Day weekend, there were 69 shootings in Chicago. The majority of them were black-on-black -black crime. This ended the deadliest month of May in 21 years. This wasn't a massacre prompted by a gay man's opinions. It was black men pointing guns at other black men, a subject on which Black Lives Matter has nothing to say. Murder was up 40% during the month, and Mayor Emanuel told the press club, we've had some success. <laughs> I don't know how he defines failure, probably like other liberals. <laughs> Shootings are up 50% year over year, the third year of increases in Chicago, and these are not legal guns being used. Cracking down on people's legal rights to own firearms, 
cracking down the Second Amendment, which Obama clearly hates, is not going to save lives. And if you doubt that, and there's sometimes some idiot in the back saying, where's your statistics from? Um, this is the liberal Chicago Tribune, so you can look it up yourself. Uh, if you think murder in Chicago is white people in the fancy parts of town, I'm afraid you're misto- mistaken. Murder in Chicago is a black problem. Black Lives Matter wants nothing to do with it. There have been almost as many murders in Chicago since 2001 as there have been soldiers who have died in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. There is only a gap of about 900 between the 8,300 combat deaths and the 7,400 Iraq murders. Uh, That's uh, that's from Homicide Watch Chicago, which is a media watchdog on crime in the city. That's why black babies in Chicago have to sleep in the bathtub, because Rahm Emanuel, the Democrats, and Black Lives Matter will not take action. I suppose I'll close out my bit on Chicago by saying, if you don't want to end up living in a corrupt hellscape, maybe elect a few conservatives. see what happens. Because so far it hasn't been working. And this is the consistent problem with black communities in, in this country um, who have, as I, as I say, I said in previous talks, some valid, valid grievances. There are some questions to answer. There, are some, there is some redress needed. But Black Lives Matter isn't the answer. And continuously re-electing Democrats like Hillary Clinton definitely isn't either. We're going to talk a little bit about illegal immigration and other law and order subjects. I spoke about this on my show to um, Sheriff Joe. Do you know Sheriff Joe? Yeah! I love, I love Sheriff Joe. He's one of America's great characters. Uh, and they're always trying to get him. Why? Because his shit works. <laughs> because he's effective and they hate it. So um, what's the, the latest thing today is he's, he's, they're trying to, some activist judge is trying to get him on racial discrimination because he suggested that if... Uh, police reports say that Hispanics commit 80% of crime, it might be a good idea to stop Hispanics, you know, on the basis that if you get a police report saying a Mercedes was speeding away at the scene of the crime, you don't go and start stopping BMWs and Fords. That, in the liberal mind, is racist. Um, I think even those of us who have seen episodes of CSI know it's actually just called policing. One of, the ma- one of the major law and order problems we have in America is a group that the social justice cancer types love to support, illegal aliens. They're their favorite people. There are at least 11.3 million illegals in America. Um, Pew Research says that's probably much higher. Um, Only Daddy really knows the answer. I mean, he knows it. Daddy who knows all things knows the answer. Um, We have no idea the true number. Why? Because they don't like to be counted. Uh, So (laughs) they don't reply to censuses. You know, these these irritating illegal immigrants just won't fill out the form. About 30% of immigrants come here illegally. Um, that's the Center for Immigration Studies. Half illegals are Mexicans, which is declining, but the slack is being picked up by Central and South Americans. As Mexico gets richer, people from uh, further down south um, to kind of try to make it through Mexico. Six states account for 60% of illegal immigrants. California, Texas, Florida, New York, New Jersey, Illinois. That's also from Pew. When I walked in, you didn't think you were going to learn things today, did you? Um, <laughs> illegals make up 5% of the American workforce. Interesting. 5%. 1 in 20 people working is illegal. Um, who do you think uh, suffers from that the most? Working class people, blacks, Hispanics, people who came here legally, people who don't have a lot of money, who are here legally and who want to work and who want to get by. And of course the white working classes, which only really Donald Trump has bothered to speak to in the last 45 years of conservative politics, so you can thank him for that. In a country where labor force participation has gone down the entire time Obama has been in office, bringing in unskilled labor possibly isn't the answer. The dirty little secret about illegal alien workers is that they, the jobs they take hurt black Americans and legal Hispanics much worse than anyone else. Illegals aren't taking computer engineering jobs away from whites. They're not going to threaten you guys. But they do hurt black people. Again, Black Lives Matter somehow omits to mention this stuff. Um, this, these issues were brought up to Congressional Black Congress by a black attorney, a member of the Civil Rights Commission, uh, Peter Kirsenow. Um, nobody listened. Uh, I'm gonna, we'll get to more immigration stuff, I think, later, because I want to wrap up. I've been going on. What, what I want to take away, uh, what, what we should take away from all of this is that there's a simple answer to all this, and it's proactive policing. Instead of the Chicago approach and Europe's approach with Muslims having no-go zones where we have to move towards the aggressive policing, we have to move towards aggressive policing that we're seeing in New York. Um, does anyone know what Stop and Frisk is? No. Well, there is a DVD called Stop and Frisk. Uh, I thought some of you might have seen it. Are you in it? 
<laughs> I was younger and I needed the money. <laughs> um, stop and Frisk uh, was a, a natural extension of the Rudy Giuliani era of policing. Rudy Giuliani, who is, uh, is, is, um, is something of a, a sort of... He's like a Voldemort figure for the left. Why? Because, again, his shit worked. Saved thousands of black lives by policing properly. Um, it was a, it, it turn, uh, Giuliani turned New York from a, a nightmare place to live into a pretty great city, into the great city it is now, actually, in a safe place where the vast majority of uh, sex in Central Park is consensual. <laughs> so, I speak from experience. <laughs> Only four out of five times, isn't it? Um, <laughs> it's fine. Looking back, it was all right. Um, stop and frisk is a uh, brief stop and questioning of a suspicious person who might have been involved in a crime or might be about to commit a crime. New York cops in the city's worst neighborhoods actively stopped upwards of half a million people uh, a year at the height of the program, around 88% of which went on their way with no issue. Is this 12% who had weapons, drugs, and other criminal intent that were caught through stop and frisk? Now, just think about that for a second. Over one in 10 people stopped had done something wrong. 10, over 10%, 12%. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's like a pretty good program. You think, yeah, that's probably quite a good use of police time. Yeah, it's racist. Um, <laughs> social justice types hate it because the vast majority of stops are black and Latino men, but New York is heavily black and Latino. And newsflash, black and Latinos are the ones committing crimes in black and Latino neighborhoods. Liberal Mayor Bill de Blasio. <laughs> Um, has drastically slashed stop and frisks from more than 500,000 or more a year to just over 20,000. In cities where police are afraid to interact with people because of their skin color, they cannot effectively do their job. They can't save lives. And this is a result of, of social justice, it's a result of progressivism. And when I, you know, some, some people don't find the gender stuff I do to be particularly um, important or significant. They're wrong, but I understand why they think, you know, it's a bit of a waste spending all your time on feminism. I've come here today to talk to you about a different dimension of social justice, a different dimension of far left progressivism that is more starkly and more obviously poisonous, more starkly and more obviously, yes, cancerous. Because this is another natural extension of the kind of philosophy that pits men against women. Social justice pits blacks against whites, Hispanics against blacks, whites against Hispanics. And it does it um, in some of the ways I've described. Um, interestingly, Rudy Giuliani has spoken very favorably about Donald Trump, uh, as has Sheriff Joe. So if you're in any doubt about the presidential candidate, most likely to um, restore law and order to America, I think you have your clue there. Most of the people who understand how policing needs to be done in this country seem to be Trump guys. If you want a good example of proactive policing, just look at how Israeli airline El Al handles security. You will never see, uh, you'll never see a nun getting an intensive search on El Al. Um, <laughs> uh, and I've never had an intensive search on El Al, more's the pity. Anyone's been, to, anyone's been to Tel Aviv knows that basically the whole population of Israel is stunning. Um, they're all just out of like a year and a half in the army. They're beautiful. You know, the, the, um, the, um, the army in Israel is, is wonderful. But they, but they do do what we now uncomfortably in this country call racial profiling. Why? Because it works. And because it saves lives. <laughs> Chicago was my big city example in this talk. Um, do you know if you look at the 20 largest cities in America, the state Chicago is in might explain why it is only Chicago that is losing population. A lot of the people leaving are blacks, wealthy and middle class blacks, because they're not safe in their own neighborhoods. It's actually a reverse migration south to the suburbs of Atlanta. Because social justice, social justice warriors don't particularly care about black children staying alive, but black people do. So those cities that are run by progressives and liberals are experiencing a black exodus. What more do you need to know? Black people don't want to live in cities where, where, where these people are elected. And that's where black lives matter. Well, black lives do matter, so why don't you pay attention to where blacks are really dying? The streets of Chicago's south and west side, along with so many other black neighborhoods in this country, Officer Friendly is far less likely to shoot you than the guy selling eight balls outside your apartment. Seems a bit crazy that it takes one gay British conservative, even one as stunning and handsome, popular, brilliant, talented... Sorry, my, my speechwriter went a bit crazy. Um, <laughs> is looking for a bonus, uh, to point out that Black Lives Matter is not even addressing the right problems. I like to imagine them organizing a conference in Antarctica. They'd all show up in beachwear. 
Except Duray, of course, he's got that fucking vest on. Um, what Black Lives Matter is doing to black people is manipulating them into doing bad things, overreacting. It's manipulating them into hysteria. It's manipulating them into bad behavior. We saw at DePaul, for instance, um, at my speech recently. And it is blinding us to the realities. It is also demonizing one of the best institutions in America. You're a very young country, and you don't have many institutions to speak of. Certainly nothing like... Uh, I had. I, I was in San, San Francisco once, and I was in one of those speakeasies. You know, the place you have to go down, um, like into a basement, um, to to drink very bad, very overpriced cocktails. Uh, and the owner of the bar very proudly told me the, the wood paneling was from 1920. <laughs> I said my college was built in 1412. Um, so you don't you don't have much in the way of history or institution in this country yet, uh, but you do have a healthy admiration and respect for the office of the President of the United States, and you do have a great institution in the police force. And it's about time that we started treating them with a bit more respect and a yeah. bit more thanks. <laughs> My penis is leaking. <laughs> As, no homo, yeah. No homo. Um, it's about time we trust them with a bit more respect and dignity. It's about time we did the same with the military and with veterans. Um, and those of you who know... Those of you who follow the, these things will know what a disgusting mess the uh, department that looks after veterans has become under Obama. He just doesn't care. Uh, you might not love Donald Trump. Uh, you may not be a Trump supporter in this audience. Um, most of you probably know that I am. Um, but faced with the option of Hillary Clinton, I would advise you, I would beg you, to turn your back on the odious, self-involved GOP establishment, the Never Trump Losers, um, and put somebody in office who is going to represent the greatest threat to political correctness this country has ever seen. It's going to represent the greatest threat to social justice this country has ever seen. It's going to stick up for the military, stick up for the police, and stick up for America. Thank you very much. I won't need that one. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Ariana Rollins. I'm the president of College Republicans, and I'm going to ask him a. I'm going to ask. And I'm going to ask Queen Milo about five or six questions, and then open up the floor for everybody else. So. Obviously, I've never done this before. <laughs> So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the hypocrisy of the social justice movement. Mm -hmm. Instead of having a rational discourse and actual discussion, they find that the most effective method of getting their, their point across is to protest and to be violent like you see at Trump rallies. So wouldn't you say that sort of goes against what they're, what they're trying to do? They need people on their side. And I would say that for every riot at a Trump rally, there's about 10,000 more votes for Donald Trump. Oh, for sure. Uh, I don't think there's any question that what happened at DePaul created a couple of, uh, you know, 20 or 30,000, by the time everyone has seen it at home on the news, new Trump voters. Uh, in a way, we should be grateful for them. I love my protesters, uh, as, as, Dad, as Daddy likes to say. I saw him in San Diego um, last week. It was very exciting, sort of a religious experience. I'm not sure I'm allowed to say it. Sorry, sorry, I'm going to cover up my crosses. I'm not, I'm just, sorry, sorry, I'm not allowed to say that. Um, no, I, you know, he... Um, he loves his protesters like I love mine because they do a lot of the hard work for us. Um, <laughs> when people at home see this stuff, when parents see this stuff, um, when they exhibit the shrieking and wailing and yelling, the shutting down, the insisting on safe spaces to insulate them from opinions, and just the general fucking rudeness, the, the discourtesy that they exhibit toward other people, um, I think they do a lot of our work for us, and I take heart in the thousands of people who email me, women who email me who say thank you, I, these feminist lunatics do not stick up for me, do not, do not represent me, do not stand for me, and in the, um, in the black people who email me and who say, it's very difficult to say this, but fucking cunts, uh, you know, and I wish they'd stop it, and I wish they'd, have, you know, they'd, 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 um, they'd stop pretending to represent black people, they really don't. I have some faith here. And I have more optimism than most conservatives do, partly because I think Trump's going to get in, but partly also because um, I'm a naturally optimistic person. I think that social justice has run its course. I think that the um, ever greater hysteria about ever smaller things is a, um, is a tell. 
I think that they realize the jig is up. I think they know that it's not working anymore. I think they know that um, they're losing. And as difficult as it may be to accept that sometimes under the oppressive conditions of universities with their speech codes and behavioral conduct codes and safe space codes and sexual conduct codes, I think the public is wising up to this stuff very quickly and I think the public really doesn't like it very much. And sooner or later politicians have to follow suit. Sooner or later the media doesn't have to, will have to follow suit. But if the media doesn't follow suit, it will simply become irrelevant, which is what's happened to most of conservative media and good fucking riddance to them. A lot of the times, the arguments you'll hear from minority groups is that the system is innately oppressive or racist or sexist or something like that. So do you think that rather instead of that, that this victim mentality is the reason why people do not succeed, why they fail if they do? Yes, of course. Um, it's easy if you are mediocre and useless at everything and um, you, you decide that being a woman or being black is your only marketable skill. It's really all you have going for you. To uh, buy into conspiracy theories about the patriarchy or about white supremacy that are, if they were ever true, and there is some truth in all of this stuff, little grains of it buried deep, deep, deep beneath the crazy. Um, if, it, if it was ever true, it certainly isn't anymore, but it's used, I think, mostly as an excuse for people to explain away why their lives suck. Um, now, many of these people's lives suck for multiple reasons. We call this intersectionality. Um, intersectional feminism, which is sort of, you know, queer, disabled, black, lesbian, whatever. Well, your, your life, honey, is terrible for all sorts of reasons. Um, but it's mostly terrible because you've decided that everything that is wrong in it is somebody else's fault, not yours. Yeah. <laughs> I think if, um, I mean, the black people I speak to that get this, like Sonny Johnson at Breitbart, um, I think Diamond and Silk understand this quite well, uh, uh, are cognizant of the fact that racism does still exist in vestigial you know, forms. There's bits of it scattered around, sure. But they're not prepared to blame everything that is wrong in their life on, on, on a conspiracy theory and what they would rather see black communities do and what many of the... the, of the tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of women who like me um also uh, believe is the best way to solve your problems is to get up get an education get a job work hard provide for your family have a sense of pride dignity and purpose in life and stop looking at other people as the answer to your problems and this is This is why I desperately want, you know, blacks to become the natural conservatives I know they really are. Um, because it is only by buying into the American dream um, and by buying into that self-reliance and determination that they can ever improve the situation in black communities. We have tried 30 years of grievance politics. We have tried 30 years or more of, of electing Democrats over and over and over again in these black cities. It hasn't worked. Let's try something else. Concept, white privilege. <laughs> so why is it why is it that the people of lighter skin are collectively judged by the color of their skin and then demanded to make reparations for the things in the past that they have no control over, especially when other races in the past have done the same or worse things? Yeah, I don't know whether it's jealousy because straight white men built everything. Um, I presume it's not, because that seems like too flippant an answer. Um, the, but, I mean, the fact that straight white men built, you know, most of literature, art, the internet, philosophy, music, space travel, uh, demo democracy, property rights, freedom, the, ru the rule of law, uh, gave women the vote, gave minorities the vote, um, emancipated blacks after slavery. I mean, I don't... Who can say? Maybe it's, maybe, maybe it's jealousy. Um, no, I, th I think it's got, um, it's got a little bit to do with that. Um, it's got most, mostly, it's simply that um, when you move into a country that is, has been white, and white people have achieved a lot in that country, and you want to buy into it, you want to become part of it, you want to be elevated up into um, that system. There are two ways to approach this. Either you throw your toys out of the pram and demand special privileges and for them demand things you haven't earned, 
or you get on, you get into the system, and you get get cracking, and you start to build the best life you can. Whether you're, you know, Hispanic coming from Mexico, whether you're, you know, a black guy whose whose family did not did not arrive in America in very happy circumstances, um, you can do that, or you can, as I say, look for somebody to blame. Now, this sort of um, white privilege, the idea of white privilege, um, as much truth as it may have had in the past, isn't really borne out much by the facts on the ground. Now, if you look at, yeah, fine, if you look at Fortune 500 CEOs or whatever, yeah, fine, most of them are white men. That doesn't really affect most people. If you look instead at the statistics on education, if you look instead at the, at the poverty statistics, if you look at where people live and how they live, you discover, for instance, that in Britain, the most educationally underprivileged group of all is, guess what? White males. Young white boys. Um, they are by far the group least likely to um, even get to university. They have by far the most problems. They are in need of desperate help and support. Nobody listens, nobody cares, nobody gives a shit. Why? Because the left has told us that white people are evil and monsters and that, you know, <laughs> bathing in white male tears is a trendy thing to do. Um, that's sociopathic and disgusting. Uh, and it's also not... <laughs> It's also not even remotely based on evidence or reason or fact. Uh, and there are, pl- there are plenty, there are tens of millions of people in this country for whom the phrase white privilege um, elicits nothing but a hollow laugh as they look around their communities with no opportunities, no money, no educational prospects, and think, where's my white privilege? Um, it doesn't really reflect the reality of the vast majority of America, or indeed the vast majority really of anywhere. It is um, a meme. It is also a myth. Um, so I think I think a, a lot of I think a concept that a lot of people who would say would say I'm a feminist or I support Black Lives Matter have trouble understanding is that. They, these people no longer want equality, so they claim to want equality for all. But, um, I, and you know, I think that's a fair assessment of what of the majority of people believe that they do. I think that they've been lied to. So, uh, but instead, the Sorry. it's these, so big, I can't. <laughs> these people it just, it just bashes things. <laughs> These people who partake in the social justice movement, they then censor, harass, spew hatred, commit actual physical violence Mm. against someone because they identify as something, which is something that they've sort of said, oh, you know, I've been prejudiced against because I identify as this or I am this. You know, I'm a conservative. I I can't help. I was born with a conservative brain. (laughs) You were born smarter. (laughs) So soon. So would you say that now on college campuses, conservatives are the most prejudiced against and persecuted minority group? Um, to, to explain my quip more fully, um, it's not actually an IQ thing. It's more likely to be a physical attractiveness thing. You're more likely to be conservative because you're hot. Did you know that? Yes. No, it's true. She's a very beautiful girl. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. All the studies, all the studies show this. Men with more upper body strength are far more likely to be conservatives. When you do, when you do surveys and you show people... Um, <laughs> I'm shredding. Um, when, when you, um, when you uh, show people uh, like a cross-section of politicians and you ask people to rank the hottest, it is almost totally conservatives down to like 0.48, and then you get a few outliers uh, up at the top. Women who are considered more classically or more conventionally beautiful um, very often end up uh, Republican. Um, and there's some reason to suppose that it, it, is, it is people who um, are pretty and smart and well-adjusted who don't feel the need to join these victimhood groups. Uh, isn't that a nicer way of because I get into trouble you see I got, I, somebody wrote, an, uh, wrote a terrible editorial about me after uh, Santa Barbara saying all he did was call feminists ugly <laughs> And as I said at the time, you know, like everything I do, it's based on fact. Uh, you know, I mean, every joke I make is based in reason, you know, based in fact, based in evidence. You are fucking mingers. Um, <laughs> but, but, there might, but there's a serious point to this. It might, be, it might be why some women end up as feminists. So my, my advice to parents is to um, stop your children eating junk food, give them some makeup, maybe put them in pageants, I don't know. Um, encourage them to be beautiful, and then they'll turn into Republicans. Um, 
I mean, you've seen the Bernie rallies, right? You go like, you see, it's, it's, no, 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 come on, no, come on. You've seen them. You've got these, like, you look at the pictures of front row of Trump, and you've got people, like, you've got frat boys, you've got these, like, nice, like, athletic looking guys, you know, and they're red hats, and these hot, skinny, like, blonde, pearl, pearl bitches. Oh, yes. Oh, you know, even me, even me, I'm just looking at the Trump crowd thinking, oh, God. Um, and you look at the Bernie rally, you know, and that's sort of like, oh, 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 oh. patriarchy! <laughs> Most of these women could do with a bit of the patriarchy. Um, no, 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 it's not a joke, that's not a joke, you know, because somebody, was it you, it was someone else, someone who's here, said um, at my last talk, you know, you just need a good dicking. Um, <laughs> Actually, there are no studies to back that up. I just think it's probably true. Uh, <laughs> the terrible low sex probably leads you into feminism. I don't know. Um, it's a sort of lesbianic cult now, isn't it? Uh, anyway, um, so to answer your question, which I slightly lost track of, but I'll try to remember while I'm babbling. Uh, are conservatives the most discriminated against minority on campus? Well, it's tough to argue that and, not, and sort of not sound slightly ridiculous, but it does seem to be sort of true if you look at the, if you look at the number, you look, look at the numbers, but you look at, you know, who is it on campus that gets censored? Who is it gets called names? Who is it gets called, you know, all the those speakers get shut down? Whose events don't get funded by faculties? Conservatives. Um, the good news for you is perhaps that I'm doing my best to turn the tide. And when, so I was at, well, I think, um, when, where was I two days ago? They're going to be offended. Where was I two days ago? UCLA. UCLA. Yeah, um, yeah, crazy. Uh, uh, yeah, so I was on stage with Dave, with, with Dave Rubin, who's lovely. Um, he's a talk show host who does the, the Rubin Report. He's great. And I sort of realized halfway through the conversation, as I said to him, well, your side did this. You know, your side is crazy, and you didn't call them out, and you didn't stop them. And where are the, where, you know, where are the normal people? He said, well, they're not here. I said, right, so what you're telling me is that the left is either insane or doesn't give a shit. That's the left now. And he was like... <laughs> and I realized what I'd done in that conversation is turned being a liberal into, so, into social stigma. <laughs> I'd, managed, I'd managed to make being left-wing really awkward. <laughs> and I don't think I've ever seen that on a campus before. So, <laughs> so anyway, I'll keep up the fight. Uh, and if I could... If I, if I, you know, no, look, I'm all for free speech, but if I can make people embarrassed to admit that they vote for, they, they vote Democrat, then fuck it, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> they should be embarrassed. They should be embarrassed. Bernie or Hillary? Are you joking? Um, they should be embarrassed. Sorry, I'm losing, I'm losing packs. I don't even know what these things do. Um, anyway, are conservatives? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, if you if you think about it objectively and, and take out the, you know, yeah, probably. I agree. Um, a very long answer, a very short question. Yes. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, it tastes well, better out here. I don't know why. Is this spring water? <laughs> What? What? <laughs> Carry on. So the last question I'm going to ask you before I open the floor up for questions from the audience... Stains on my blue dress. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, is there anything... Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Got it in the end. You know, I want her as VP pick. Oh, Monica. Yeah, no... no. <laughs> I thought this was a good school. My God. No, I, um... No, I want her as VP pick. Wouldn't that be the greatest troll ever? So like Trump, Trump did go up against Hillary, and he's like, um, he's like, well, I don't know, I have to pick my, I pick my vice president. Everyone's like, ooh, ooh is it going to be, is it going to be Newt Gingrich? <laughs> you know, is it going to be Sarah from <laughs> Monica Lewinsky? <laughs> 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 Sorry, carry on. So, is there anything that you would like to say to the protesters that you've had in the past, currently, and in the future? Yes, carry on. Please, carry on. Keep coming. Keep coming. You know what? I've told them how to beat me. I wrote a column explaining how to beat me. It was like, come, be calm, be reasonable, bring facts. They're too stupid and self-involved to do that. I've told them time and time again. They won't listen. They want to disrupt. They want to cause a fuss. So let's have it. Because every time they do it, it serves us. Every time they do it, they just damage their own cause. Every time they do it, they get Donald Trump that little bit closer to the White House. Um, so, you know, my message to protesters is keep coming. So now I'm going to have you pick 
seven people first, and then they're going to line up over there, and then I have, I have, to, I have to pick seven people. You have to pick seven people. Oh, they're all going to be black. No, I'm kidding. Um, should I, should I, oh, I can put your hands up, and I'm going to wander, and I'm going to find, I'm going to find people I like. All right. All right, you. Who else wants to ask a question? Okay. You. You. All right. Hello. I'm here. The guy in the blue. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you. Go. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're wearing my clothes. You. Yeah. Step. How many more do I have? I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to go to the other side. It's not fair. But you have to go queue up here. You have to go queue up here. How many do I have left? Two. You. You. Yeah, you. Uh, do I have one more? I think, yeah, all right. You. Yeah. Huh? I'm going to pick more when they're done. Oh, fine. Good, good, good. Good, because I only went over by two. <laughs> Apparently, no, I, I, went, I went over by two, and then I had my naughtiness. I was admonished. I had my, my naughtiness punished. I'm, I'm going to be allowed to pick more afterwards, apparently, so don't lose heart. Milo, first of all, thank you for coming. We well, love you. Thank and, you so much. Uh, this was cancer. The feminism was cancer. When did you decide to really take a stand against it? What, what made you click and do that? So I used to be a technology journalist, and I discovered that I was getting into a lot of trouble. Thank you for the question. Um, getting into a lot of trouble saying things like, men are just better at tech jobs. Do we need to do apologize for that? And my, my thinking at the time was like, I don't want to fuck you. Why do I have to be nice to you? Like, we're, we're just better at it. It's just a male brain thing. Like, what do you want from me? You know, you look at the IQ distribution between men and women, and there are way more men right up at the very top ends. Like, they're at the bottom, you know, to, to be fair. Um, you know, prisons are full of men, not because um, the system is sexist against men, though of course it is. Women get much shorter sentences, you know, men get arrested more, all the rest of it. Um, the prisons are full of men because, um, you look at the IQ distribution between men and women, women tend to cluster around the mean. Um, but men uh, represent all of the sublime geniuses, but also the knuckle draggers. So if you... <laughs> Um, so if you have a, a little boy, he's more likely to be, you know, a Mozart or a, a Charles Manson. Actually, they're both, actually they're both clever. Um, uh, or, or just make nothing of his life and drop out and do nothing than if you have a girl who's more likely to, to uh, make you proud. Um, but this is, you know, this is, this is why this happens. Um, and, I no and I noticed that the reaction was extraordinary. And I said, well, isn't this the tech industry? Aren't we supposed to be doing like numbers and facts and studies and stuff? Aren't you supposed to care about this? Like, no, this is disgusting, horrible sexism. You can't talk about this. Like, what do you mean you can't talk about this? I'm talking about what the fuck I want. I'm going to continue to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it because I find it interesting. I'm going to continue to talk about it. And I said, no, you can't. You guys, I got fired four times from the, from the newspaper I worked for. They kept hiring, hiring me back on more money, so they can't pay to me that much. Um, <laughs> But um, and I discovered that in these industries that were male-dominated because they appealed to the male brain, um, uh, tech, and then later in my career, gaming, um, these were the industries that were probably the most welcoming to women because there weren't many women there. You know, you can imagine the time. You know, sort of, uh, you know like, I'm sorry if this offends anybody. Actually, I'm not. Um, you know, just you imagine the programmer types. You know, sort of trail mix. <laughs> um, you know, and they're desperate for women to be around them. They, they want more women more than anything else. And if you're a female, if you're a female startup founder in the tech industry, you get in all these women in tech spreads and like, look at this brave sister, like in a male-dominated whatever. You know, it's a huge competitive advantage. And I was thinking, am, am I going? crazy like why every time you walk into the room like 50 people go you know it doesn't matter you get as fat as you want they'll still want you you know what's the problem here I couldn't work it out completely denying any brain chemistry whatsoever so I I just thought this is insane I'm going to start writing about this and as I found out more about it I discovered that actually all of society is like that and that the feminization of politics and the media, the entertainment industry and everything else has made it pretty horrible for men everywhere and it's getting worse. And if I, as somebody who, you know, freed from the shackles of having to be polite to women, uh, can really be courteous and respectful and, uh, say, you know, I'm perfectly polite, but I don't have to say things I don't mean. I don't have to lie to them like you guys do. Um, you know, yes, yes, a little wonderful one. Yeah, just as good as men. Um, you know, at, at whatever it is. No, I don't, mm, mm. <laughs> Men and women are different. They're different. We're good at different things, and that's fine. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. We're different. We have different brain chemistry, different bodies. 
for Ronnie. Okay. What I meant, I don't know, you know, you just say, say to a woman, you know, you're just, as, you're just as good as a man at whatever, football. Have you seen women's football? Have you seen women's football? <laughs> There's a reason, you know, the, the, the women's American Olympic hockey team plays high school boys when they're preparing for international matches. I mean, mm, um, you know, there are things that men are good at and things that girls are good at, and that's fine. Anyway, so I discovered the whole world was like this, and if I, as somebody freed from the obligation to lie to women, as most men are as part of their chivalrous um, courtship conducts, uh, could tr start to sort of redress some of that injustice and imbalance and insanity, I would try. Making an impression is all about contrasts. Listen to Gangster Rap in the afternoon and Wagner in the evening. Wear Louis Vuitton, but smoke Newports. Lunch at Claridge's, but dine at KFC. Why spend tens of thousands on a fancy car when you can make just as much of an impression stepping out of a used Toyota in Gucci sunglasses and a three-piece Savile Row suit? I'm not entirely sure this is true, actually. You can get out of a used Toyota in Gucci sunglasses and a three-piece suit and create the same impression as stepping outside of a Maybach. But you know what? Let's go with it. With True Car, you can connect with a local certified dealer of your choosing so you can lock in guaranteed sailings off the MSRP. I have no idea what that is. I guess you do. And enjoy a better buying experience. True Car customers are more likely to enjoy a faster buying process when they connect with True Car certified dealers. Over 2 million cars have been sold to True Car users by the True Car certified dealer network and there are over 11,000 True Car certified dealers nationwide. You will work directly with the True Car certified dealer and True Car users save an average of $3,279 off the Oh, I know it's manufacturer's suggested retail price. There we go. So I'm basically like an old person who has to who's <laughs> forgot <laughs> This is this is Tom my producer in the background who is back uh it, 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 as a, as a special cameo appearance to snigger at me while I attempt to get through the ad break. Um, thank you for that, Tom. Uh, using the True Car website or the True Car app, you can easily find the car you want. So when you're ready to buy a new or a used car, visit truecar.com or download the True Car app to enjoy a better car buying experience. Some features are not available in all states. I have been Miley Yiannopoulos. Thank you for listening. Forget finding a cure for cancer. I've got the cure for feminism. This is the Mylionopolis show. All right, so I'm what's considered a non-traditional student here at UC. I'm 33 years old, and I've, my friends and I have always been conservative. I've spent a decent amount of time in the music industry, which is like a progressive fucking hellhole. Um, <laughs> Coming here to UCI, I expected it to be like just another one of these hellholes, but to my pleasant surprise, I found that many students that I talk to, maybe because of the way I look, they're more apt to hear what I have to say, and um, especially my gay friends. And what's important to me is I get to a point with them where they say, I hear what you're saying, and it all makes sense, but it seems like, like they think I'm trying to pull a wool over their eyes or something, and I can't seem to kind of get past that, that, that little valley. And I guess what I want to ask is, when I'm talking to my gay friends, how do I make the case that the progressive agenda is not to their best, not in their best interest? Oh God, it's so mystifying why any gay person would be left wing, or any gay person would be a feminist. That doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> why would somebody who loves men and has sex with men and has men's interest in, you know, men's interest is there? Crisp. Uh, people who fought against, reacted against the establishment of their times, who were unafraid to be different, dif difficult, dissident thinkers. Today, to be punk rock, you have to be a conservative. And it's quite clear that lots of the things, you know, whether it's trans bathroom hell, this awful thing, um, or, you know, whether it's any of the other things. I mean, progressives are now coming for white gay men, you know, because we're, we're apparently privileged too. Uh, you know, the, the progressive left does not act in, in gay people's interests because, and I think this is the way to get through to them, if they're not going to listen to reason facts, to um, get to them through culture, because that tends to be more effective. Say to them, look, these people want to control your speech. They want to control the words you can use. They want to tell you what's problematic. They want to tell you who you can love. Like, uh, you know, they want to tell you whether your grinder profile is racist. You know, this is a real thing. It was in the Daily Beast. It was in Daily Beast. You know, a gay, you know like saying white senior grinder profile is racist. It's not racist. It's just a sexual preference. Mine says black only. That's Is that racist? Um, it doesn't actually. It, I've said this joke so many times, but I'm going to tell you again anyway, because I like it. Um, does anything ever got cut from a column? of mine. You know, I don't actually say black only because that's offensive. I just say, you know, um, don't contact me if you're under seven inches and you know who your dad is. Um, <laughs> the only thing they've ever cut from a column of mine. Um, again, grounded in fact, 70%. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's fine, I'll be daddy. Uh, no, I, it's, um, you get to the, get to, oh, come on. Where did you think you, where did you, think you were coming? Uh, 
The, um, no, the, the way to get through them is culture. So, look, the best things about being gay are the um, mischief-making. And to be a mischief-maker, you have to at least be a libertarian these days. And it is precisely the highest and most perfect expression of gay culture is gay culture at its most raucous um, and at its naughtiest, at its most subversive. And gay culture is basically dead. It is boring. There's nothing interesting about it whatsoever. Um, if, you, if you're a gay person and you want to re-examine, re-explore what has made gay people great in history, it's not gay marriage. It's not getting a dog, you know, and a, a, with a boyfriend that turns into a husband you hate and a job you hate and a Volkswagen Golf. No, it's, it's not any of those things. It's tumbling out of a nightclub on a Monday afternoon and off your tits on ketamine and nobody can judge you for it. But it's also, but it's also being artists, being musicians, being the creative, at the creative forefront of civilization and culture. And all of those things, the, you know, the most genre-defying works of art are impossible in a society that polices culture according to these ridiculous norms. And if you want to be somebody who pushes forward the boundaries of thought and speech and creativity, you cannot exist in a world ruled by social justice. It's the single greatest reason why gay people should reject it completely. Hello. Hey, uh, my name is David Turian, and um, I'm actually coming here um, to reject what you are proposing here. Okay. And I came here to do it respectfully because I don't think what these people are doing outside is effective. I figure you could give me a few minutes to speak my piece if everyone's open to that of right course. here. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't it, isn't it sad when somebody has to apologize for a hundred people outside and we give them a round of applause for being reasonable and polite? This is the current state of the left. Well, let me speak for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. you probably won't like what I have to say, but anyway. That's fine. Um, I know all the more reason to say right. it. Anyway, I, I wanted to ask the audience, um, how many people here um, who considers themselves anti-feminist or anti-social justice warrior, just a show of hands, like how many of you have ever... Um, taking a basic introductory perspectives on gender course. Yeah, that's exactly Why would you what willingly I infect yourself with cancer? Sir? Because I think that what you're doing is, is spreading misinformation about feminism. I think in order to understand feminism, you have to do your homework. And that includes getting a proper education to understand what these issues are that feminists are talking about. Um, the word, when I took a, when I took a um, class at Cal State San Bernardino, it was called Perspectives on Gender. And they were, it was taught by three professors of different disciplines that gave us the humanities, social science, and natural science basis for a lot of these ideas that feminists are talking about. They didn't come up to us over our heads and beat us over the head with the patriarchy or, you know, safe spaces or any of this crap you talk about. Which, by the way, I agree with you on a lot of these things. You don't have to accept these things to be a feminist, by the way. And I think that's kind of what you do is you kind of straw man feminists and think that that's what it's all about when you don't know what you're talking about. Frankly, I think, I think what we have ahead. to do, we have to, because, I mean, feminism is the, probably the movement in, in intellectual history uh, has been the least able to uh, consistently, reliably and, uh, define itself. And I'm sure it's got nothing to do with the fact that it's all women. Um, but uh, it's been the movement that has never been able to agree on a single definition of itself. So what we have to do is just look externally and see what does it look like? What do they say? What do they do? So I look at the prospectuses of uh, gender studies courses and women's studies courses. I find them wanting. I look at the uh, columns but from feminist journalists. Okay, good. Well, let's hear from somebody else. Well, no, the thing is, is that I think this whole campus tour, what you're trying to do is sidestep the entire academic process. Your, your ideas have not passed peer review. You haven't done your scientific research. You haven't even done anything. And you can laugh at me all you want. Go ahead, try to make me into a triggly puff. Can you give an example of something that you've learned in that class that you would Example. Let me, let me tell you what I've learned in that class. Isn't we, everyone? We have learned, we have learned that basically... Um, there is a basis in natural science, social science, and humanities for a lot of these issues. And if you understand the underpinnings, when feminists come to you talking about the patriarchy, you're not going to freak out and think it's some big conspiracy. You're going to understand what they mean. So I would encourage everyone in this class to sign up. And if you can't do that, um, go to my YouTube channel, bitch.ly. Oh. 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 David, David underscore, Thank you very much. I'm
I'm afraid I didn't. I, I, we've been going for a long time, and I still haven't heard a, a decent one question. question. It was one question. I think I think we're done. So thank you very much. It's time for you to give the mic to somebody else. Thank you very much. I think it's perfect. it's a perfectly reasonable. So, in that term. Um, all right. No, let's be let's be let's be respectful. Let's be respectful. He came here perfectly. Look, let's be let's be nice. Let's be nice to the poor guy. He arrived perfectly respectfully. He was triggered by the end, but um, he's, he started off perfectly respectfully before his rage quit. Uh, now, in that. In that word, in that word, Stavard, I'm going to do him a favour because I, I, I'm going to try and distill down what I think he was trying to say, which is um, that I'm mischaracterising feminism. But what I was trying to say to him was, we can only, we only know it by its, uh, by what we see, right? We can only judge it by what it produces. It produces lies. The sorts of gender studies and, and women's studies sort of feminism that he is seeking to. Um, uh, to stand up for has produced the lie of the wage gap, which suggests that women are paid less than men for the same work. They're not. It has produced the lie of campus rape culture. It has resulted in an atmosphere in which it is fine to belittle and demean and criticise men um, for their for their um, their organs and their orientation. It has created a culture in which kill all white men, masculinity so fragile, and I bathe in male tears become not just permitted but encouraged. Those are the results of the kind of gender feminism that he would like to stick up for. And frankly, I'll save myself the time with the textbook. Um, first off, I'd like to say I'm a student at LBC yesterday. I'm sorry. Okay. I, was, I was trapped in a hotel room by my management. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I can tell that. No, we figured that out. Thank you. Um, my question also, I'm visiting from Georgia, so I'm using some past experiences. If it doesn't relate to other people, then, you know, like I said, I'm from Georgia. Welcome. Um, <laughs> so, my question is, there's, I feel like in high school, um, and I've seen this through, through some of my gay friends especially, there's, there's almost this pressure, especially put off by feminists, to be androgynous or, or, or different by identifying yourself with a different gender identity or, you know, just somehow standing out with your gender and, and your, your sexuality. There's a pressure to have a different sexuality than what you may actually have. I think it's true. So, I have a friend who, whose mom, actually, she, she didn't wear dresses and stuff when she was little, and her mom constantly treated her differently because of that, and when she came out as a lesbian... Yeah. Um, as far as orientation is concerned, I don't really believe in lesbians, but we'll, we'll save that for another day. Um, uh, the other sort of thing that you're touching on is gender identity. Gender identity is a sort of um, cruel... Uh, it's, it's a sort of cruel torture inflicted on young people by the progressive left. Um, it is probably the worst example of systematic child abuse since, you know, the satanic ritual abuse scandals, which turned out not to be true, in fact, in the 90s. Um, the most widespread systematic child abuse I can think of is telling, as they do in Canada, young, children, young boys who find themselves uh, sexually exploring other young boys that they must be women. What the evidence suggests is if you leave them alone, they grow up into perfectly well-adjusted gay men. But now the uh, trend, and it is that, the trans trenders, um, are encouraging you know, parents to, to say that their, their, children, their child was born in the wrong body. Most of this genderqueer stuff uh, started on the left as, a, as part of the war on men, as a way of hating men. To, to get at men, you have to deconstruct and criticize and, and attack all of the things that make men men. One of the, you know, this, this sort of um, genderqueer asexuality stuff is basically, um, you know, people who can't get a date trying to tear down the barriers between men and women because they don't conform to those stereotypes themselves. And even left-wingers 
sort of tacitly accept this. If you look at what Lindy West was writing in Jezebel a few years ago, uh, she was saying, you know, well, because I don't conform to traditional beauty standards. No, because you can't stop eating. Um, because you don't, you don't conform to traditional beauty standards. You know, that's why she became left wing. Well, she's just spelt it all out for you guys. They told you, they told you why they're like this. Women who don't look like women and aren't happy with how they look, aren't happy with how they are. Men who aren't happy with how they are, try to ruin it for everyone else. And this is the essence of social justice. It is miserable, damaged people trying to make the rest of us as fucking miserable as they are. And this is... This is how you fight it. You turn your back on them in a, um, you know, turn, turn, turn your back on them in a, in a charitable but good-natured Christian manner. And you say, you know what? Thank you. I'm sorry you're miserable, but I'm going to get on with my life. And I'm going to have a happy, wonderful life. I'm an upbeat, joyful person. I'm going to have a great life. I'm going to have a nice car, a nice house, a wife I fuck every day, you know, and be beautiful children and uh, everything that I want. Because I'm not going to allow you to tear me down to the level of somebody who doesn't know who they are or what they are and suggest, uh, you know, and, and allow you to dictate social norms to the rest of us. It's... It's very distressing to me that the people least qualified to lecture us on anything are the ones given platforms to lecture us on everything. The people who are least qualified. I mean, you know, it's like you pick your fattest, ugliest, loneliest, most horrible failure of a friend for dating advice. Well, that's what women are doing when they go to feminism for advice on how to be a woman. You know? It's insane. And it's great meeting another gay Trump supporter. Um, <laughs> We're an endangered species. <laughs> We're the real oppressed minority in America. You know, that's that's what my question is. What would yeah. you what would you tell people that are afraid to come out um, as Trump supporters in a state like California? <laughs> Isn't it sad? You see, we have to come out twice. We have to come out twice. First is easy. You're gay. Oh, fantastic. You could take me shopping. You're going to be so beautiful and fabulous. You're going to listen to all great music. Mom, I'm a Trump supporter. Oh, God. Oh, God. You know, I, could, I could have coped with it if it was that slimy amphibian Ted Cruz. You know, it looks like something I... Looks like lion Ted. Looks like something I left in a tissue. Uh, <laughs> Looks like something that slides out after I remove my cock. No, I'm kidding. Um, too far, too far, too far, too much, too much, too much. I, that's Santorum. Uh, I didn't even plan that. I just remember. Uh, okay, no. Um, I, th I, would, I would give you a similar answer to the one before, trying to, you know, talk, talk to people about the fun and mischief and dissidents. Trump is definitely an engine of chaos. And I think gays are on a leash and slap an Obama on the bottom and tear up a tranny law thing and then stand up and demand attention for an hour. Um, you know, straight people don't get to do this. You know, you know? Uh, I mean, Trump is, like a, Trump is like a gay icon in that respect. He's just as ridiculous as we are. Um, and and um, I think... If we want to rediscover what makes gay people wonderful, um, it's fairly obvious where their political allegiances should uh, rest. And that's with the fun, mischievous, dissident, uh, politically, politically incorrect candidate who is going to rip apart um, the nannying and the pearl clutching. The people who want to control what we can say, do, think, be, all, the kind of, all that kind of nonsense. Trump is a natural, natural and very obvious candidate for gays. And in fact, I would give you just a a word of encouragement, because I don't know how many other gay Trump supporters you know, but I was at the rally in San Diego. There's fucking thousands of them. Uh, so <laughs> don't worry. You're not alone. Go look, go look them up online. There's tons of us. Um, and, you know, it's, remember, you're making the obvious logical choice. And anybody who looks at you askance or with confusion in their eyes, they're the ones with the problem. Uh, you spoke about the best way to reduce uh, black on black violence would be to be uh, to do proactive policing. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we instead just save blue lives and black lives at the same time by ending the drug war? Oh, I absolutely agree. That that's yeah. definitely part of it. Uh, the war on drugs is a, is a horrible mess. I sometimes, I sometimes, 
I sometimes like to be mean to um, libertarians because, by and large, they deserve it and they have such thin skins. It's fun. Um, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. They're, they're worse than feminists. Um, but, no, no. Uh, but one thing they're definitely right on. Um, the war on drugs has been a, a colossal disaster. And although I have the utmost sympathy with social conservatives who, you know... Um, want to protect people from themselves by uh, removing drugs, you know, removing the availability of drugs. The fact is, nobody has a fucking clue how addiction works. Hey, Milo. Hi. Thanks for coming down to Orange County. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed our good Mexican food and calm ocean breezes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. If you've been watching the debates and researching candidates' history with who, they, who they've accepted money from, who they've who they've given to and who they've endorsed, you know, you know, you know that Donald Trump has been registered as a Democrat and has donated money to the Clintons over the years. Mm -hmm. Now, for a person who is on that fringe of wanting to vote for Trump because two of his other candidates were knocked out, Rand Paul and John Kasich, what do you Kasich, have to say really? to those? <laughs> you started off so intelligent. <laughs> What do you have to say? To I liked the... you so much. Oh, don't, don't stop, please. <laughs> what do you have to say to the people who are afraid that they might be voting for a quote unquote liberal, liberal in disguise? Um, well, I think anyone who thinks that he's running sort of uh, interference or running some kind of undercover campaign for the Clintons is insane. Um, <laughs> he's clearly not doing anything with the Clintons. Just wait till you see what he, what he unleashes on Hillary. Uh, crooked Hillary is brilliant. How does he do? How does he come up with these? How does he do it? How does he do it? I do this for a living. He's fucking brilliant. It's just, it's just, just the right word. Just the right word. Um, look, you know, it's very straightforward. He was a businessman. You know, I'm a fucking nutcase Rabbit conservative. And if I've been running a company, it had been politically and if it had been uh, uh, economically expedient for me to donate to every fucker politician in the city, I would have done it. Um, you know, if I could have gone to, and, and if, I'm a, if I'm a businessman not running for office and I get to go to, like, the Clinton wedding, of course I fucking go. Um, you know, like, I don't see anything, re anything weird about that. What's weird is imagining that a businessman would cut himself off from 50% of political influence for a political run in 20 years' time that he doesn't even know he's going to do yet. That's mad. Hi Milo. Hello. I'm baked Alaska. <laughs> so I'm a junior in high school. I'm going into my senior year. Very beautifully dressed junior in high school. <laughs> Perfect. Perfectly. Is that the sea foam? Yes, it is. Yes, yeah, sea foam. It's, 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 it's my favorite color in the collection. I have a good uh, eye. Um, <laughs> you do. So, so I will be applying to colleges next year, and I wanted to know, over the course of your tour, what, from experience, what colleges are the best for a sane, reasonable person? Oh, God. Stay, just, stay just stay home. Just stay home. Oh, God, I can't in good faith recommend you go to any of the schools I've spoken at. Not one of them. Uh, but I'll give you... Uh, no, I'm, I'm, uh, you should, of course, go to college and apply to college. Um, so here's, yeah, here's my advice. There are a lot of schools where there are very sound, reasonable groups of people who simply don't get involved in campus politics. And so um, I, when I was at Bucknell, which is one of the first stops on my tour, there's a small liberal arts college in Pennsylvania... Um, yeah, batshit insane. Uh, you know, the, the faculty gave, um, so, gave, the, gave the poor kids organizing. He works for me now, Tom Sakata. He's a great, um, going to be a great reporter. Um, they gave these kids so much hell trying to put this, this talk on, like throwing conditions on at the last minute. All of the slimy tactics that university administrations use to try to get things cancelled without cancelling them. Um, we got through it, we did great, and then I spent two days just partying with, like, Sikai and Fiji, and it was great. Uh, and um, they, what, the, what, they've, what they've mastered, what they've worked out, is that you just don't go anywhere near campus, uh, and then you can have a nice time. So I would encourage you to um, find a school that has a really, really healthy Greek system. 
Because if you find a school with a, um, a good Greek system, with good, strong fraternity life, you're going to discover plenty of people who are not mental. You're going to have a great social life. You're going to be able to avoid a lot of the insanity that happens on like campus universities where, everyone, where everyone's uh, packed in together. And you're going to be able to avoid the vast majority of the nonsense that um, ruins people's lives who spend all their time on campus. So that, um, I, I'm not, I can't give you a specific school in, in, in perfectly good faith. I can't. Um, but even at Bucknell, there was a thriving, enthusiastic, and and really fun. Uh, I mean, I, I I didn't want to leave, you know, even at Bucknell. So you you'll be fine. You'll find good friends. You'll find good people to to, um, to fall in with. Just go somewhere with a strong Greek system. Um, also, will you be doing pictures and signatures after? Because I'd of, like to get my patriarchy. To sign of, I, I will not let you leave without signing that shirt. Um, I'm going to. Um, Sorry? Have to be inside. Too many protesters outside. Yeah, no, that's fine. We're going to do it inside. I'm also going to beg your indulgence. I'm going to let, um, let me, because I wasn't, I don't know how many, this isn't a very gay room, so you might not have entirely understood what I meant by the polyester thing, but it's really fucking disgusting. It's so sticky and horrible. So when we're done, I'm going to very quickly run and change, but then I'm going to come straight back and then I'll meet everybody. And I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll be here as long as we can. <laughs> But I looks really good, so it's fine. Quick question. Oh. You have some fans in the audience. Well, it's uh, thank you for that, and uh, kind of keen on, on the importance of standing up against political correctness, particularly when when lives are on the line. Mm -hmm. And when we look at Donald Trump, there's a really perverse hypocrisy on that. Mm -hmm. We look at uh, Pamela Geller, who many people in this room won't know. She's probably on the forefront of fighting Islamic terror in America. Right. And she organized the Draw Muhammad cartoon in Garland, yeah, Texas. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, oh, I'd enter that, but good gravy, what if I won? You know, the $10,000 prize wouldn't cover a half month's worth of security for all the, the danger that she put herself in. And actually, it would have been the worst massacre in America had the guards not shot the two Islamic jihadists that were storming it. Yeah. Blood, it was, it was the most, one of the most brave things in the last 10 years any woman had stood up to do. Yeah, I think she's pretty cool. You do, but Donald Trump doesn't. Now, when Donald Trump was asked about this, he said, what, don't they have anything else better to do in Texas than draw Muhammad? We don't need to be antagonizing these people. He said about Pamela Geller, no, she's a bad leader. This is a woman, when we needed a leader to stand up against political correctness, when people were literally going to be murdered, he took a powder. He was wrong. Okay, second one, I appreciate that. Second one. You're, you're British, so you may not appreciate it, but the earliest lesson uh, on American justice in the American way is Herbie the Love Bug. I don't know if you've ever seen it or not. I have not. I'm okay. Sorry. So it's a, it's a magical card. There's an evil, evil developer, and he wants to build Hawk Towers, which is a big H, which is kind of funny because Trump went on. Anyway, there's a little old lady who won't sell her house. You're and, about eminent domain now. Right? And he can't get her to sell. He can't get her to sell. And you know, in way back when, it wasn't even a concept that you could employ thugs from the government to take the little old lady's house. Yeah. So he gets goons to harass her, and it's a magical Volkswagen that saves the day against somebody who would use thuggish tactics. Mm -hmm. And now we have a president who's down with that. He's, he's well, we may, violating. We may have a president. May have a president who violates the most cherished, earliest political lesson anybody will learn is you can't use thuggery to take somebody's private property. And I can't imagine you're down with that either. No, I'm not. Um, I don't think that he's a perfect candidate. And I don't think if you spoke to any, anybody else who likes Trump that they would say that he's a perfect candidate. Ann Coulter doesn't think he's perfect. Ann Coulter said on my show she thinks he's mental. Uh, you know, but he's so good on the wall and so good on trade that she's going to vote for him anyway and try to, and try to stick up for him. Um, look, Trump shoots from the hip a lot. Um, sometimes, you know, doesn't look into things, I think. I'm... Um, I don't have any control for saying that. Well, why would I care? I don't have any control for saying that. I want to be press secretary so bad. Um, <laughs> You know, Daddy likes to. You know, Daddy's asked many times on many things, and he's not a professional politician. He hasn't had forty years to come up with the right answers to everything, to look into everything. I don't, for instance, think um, that he gave very much thought to the transgender bathroom issue. I think he correctly. Well, one of two things happened. He either didn't give a shit about it, so just you know, and didn't look into it, um, and thought, you know what. Nobody cares about this, and he's right about that, by the way. Nobody cares outside of like university campus. And ordinary people don't care about this stuff. He correctly calculated nobody would care, and thought, you know, well, I'll just wrong for the liberals. Um, 
or just you know just just gave an answer without you know really perhaps no you know not without sitting down for a four hour briefing about it. Who knows? Who knows? Um, eminent domain stuff. It's inexcusable. It is inexcusable, um, but I don't think we've ever had a candidate for president who is crafted from marble. You know, the vision of the platonic ideal of conservative perfection is very clear. Donald Trump isn't that. You know, <laughs> it's very clear he's not the perfect candidate. But the effect of Donald Trump, the overall um, results of a Donald Trump presidency, I think, will be positive for the things that I care about, which is free speech, liberty, and um, destroying political correctness. Um, on the um, uh, Pamela Geller thing, I think it was simply wrong. Um, but I think he probably, if he sat down and had a conversation with you about it, probably agree, agree with that. Okay. I'm allowed to pick three more. Is anybody else wearing my clothes? Oh, oh, terrible. Oh, there is? Oh, well, you first then. Ah, two more, two more. One. Oh, can I come this side this time? Splendid. Good choice. It's a nice color. That's the one I have. This is not a good question. You have a question. Then come. Yes. It's lovely. You have to. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. perfect. <sighs> okay, so. Um, Hi. Hopefully, there's some other people in this uh, room or that are listening that also can kind of relate to what's going on with uh, what I'm seeing at my university. So, when I enrolled, I enrolled as a criminology and criminal justice major. And. Um, and the, the faculty in that department have slowly just made changes to it throughout the, throughout the time I've been there. And now it's referred to as criminology and justice studies. And this Ooh. justice part is referring to social justice. Mm. And it's one of those degrees that you joke about as being useless, you know, women's studies, race well, studies. anything ending in studies. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and, don't waste um, your parents' money on anything ending in studies. And unfortunately, I'm stuck in it. And I'm hoping to transfer in the spring to a different, to a real de- degree program at a different school. Yeah. But... What should I do in the meantime? Because, uh, I mean, I'm, as a conservative, I really just don't fit into the program. And as a straight white male, uh, they You're already the just cringe. The they just cringe at my existence. <laughs> um, but so what can, can I do in can the you, are, you allowed to just, are you allowed to leave? Can you go and do something else? Can you go volunteer for the police or something? Uh, no, I still have some prereqs to make and stuff. That will oh, also do? help with uh, the next... Um, well, the only advice I can really give you, and I'm sorry this isn't hugely happy advice, this isn't, the, this isn't the best thing, this is not what you're going to want to hear, but people who have seen my talks before are going to know that this is the case. The best advice I can give you is keep your head down and get it done. Um, what these people want to do is to destroy your prospects by catching you out, by making you lose your shit, by making you to have some big moment where you drop out of school, or you fight with your professors, or you do something to... Um, uh, to ruin your own chances. Well, your success is the best revenge you can have against them. Transfer out, do a real subject, but keep your head down and get your grades while you're there now. Because the, the the greatest victory you could hand them would be to you know to, to, to do something brave or do something uh, you know um, to, to to protest. Just get through it. All right. Thank you. So I've only just started um, following you, Milo. I think you're amazing. amazing. Your videos are amazing. They, Thank you. They make me half open to society again, right? Um, I just wanted to know, you know, what are your views on abortion? What are your views on Trump and on abortion? And what do you think about um, feminists and always demanding, you know, free stuff for abortion? Um, I think it's murder. And I don't think that uh, dressing it up in nice words and saying, you know, it's a woman's right to choose her reproductive choices and women's bodily autonomy... Um, should obscure the fact that we're talking about the murder of another um, of another human being. That's not a particularly popular position among young conservatives. I accept that, um, but it's informed partly by my Catholic faith and partly by my um, by my reading and thinking and you know my, my political philosophy, my social philosophy, my what I feel in my heart. Um, you know, I, I think it's spoken of too lightly. I think I also think. Um, you know, if you, I, I, there's something creepy and disgusting about how enthusiastic liberals are to fund Planned Parenthood, which is basically a black baby killing machine. 
Um, and it's, you know, it's, anyone who knows anything about the founder, Margaret Sanger, um, who was a eugenicist who specifically um, started Planned Parenthood to keep the black population down, um, who described black people in disgusting terms and who Hillary Clinton has praised um, effusively. Uh, I think you can see in the genesis of that organization exactly what it was set up to do. Um, I, like I say, my, my, posi- my pro-life position is not going to be hugely popular among a lot of young conservatives, because I realize that, so- that social-, social conservatism has had its day. Um, I agree with young conservatives on most things, um, but probably not that. And Trump has been flip-flopping on it, and I wish he would stop. I love that answer. Well, my name is Kevin. Kevin! <laughs> Hello, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for choosing me for a question. But um, my question is, uh, you know, I've, I've been someone who's very anti-social justice and anti-feminist and uh, doing a lot of reading and stuff into that area. And I've come across uh, some views that say that the, the problem that we have at universities is not a problem within itself, but a symptom of a larger problem, a problem that we have nowadays, like with society. It's certainly true that some of this stuff is bubbling up in high school, and it's certainly true that the sort of therapeutic culture, which is replacing rigor and um, and challenging academic environments at universities, is happening at high schools. And it's very it's being taken up very enthusiastically in high schools because, of course, high schools are supposed to be slightly more nurturing spaces. They are supposed to be, you know, when you, when you go, you know, people start school at four, five, six. They are supposed to be homes from home, and they are supposed to, to some degree, coddle and guide young kids through life. So social justice is making great and enthusiastic headway in these places because it sort of is already what those teachers are there to do. They're all, you know, slightly dim but nice people who just want to, like, you know, spend time around women, cause, around children because they don't have any of their own, whatever. Um, you it's just statistics it's just statistics don't look at me don't look at me if you don't like it you know go look it up um (laughs) slightly you know lower than average intelligence childless um you know people in their 20s who just want unconditional love quite often become preschool teachers and um you know they they of course have that nurturing instinct and it's it's mapped very 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 well uh i think as as this sort of cancer has started to spread elsewhere in society um, whether it's a symptom of a, a social justice symptom of a larger problem, I think social justice is the problem. I think it is, inf- it, it is a result of a number of different things, including um, white guilt. I think middle class white guilt is a big problem. Um, us feeling bashful and ashamed of our accomplishments and willing to listen to people almost no matter how insane they are who say that we only have what we have because we fucked somebody over once, um, or we only have what we have because we're racist or sexist or oppressors or whatever. Um, we're very ready to listen to those hucksters and fraudsters. We're very li- ready to listen to those sharks like Al Sharpton, the shakedown merchants, um, because we sometimes lack... Uh, and we sometimes lack... We're sometimes not very good at being proud of our accomplishments in the West. Um, and it's sure we've done some bad things in ancient history, but so is, every, so is everybody else. And there's something about Western civilization, European and American culture, which is slightly self effacing, despite all of the sort of America fuck yeah stuff which we all love and we all enjoy. There's something when you know when you get when you calm down a little bit and you sound more sensible, there's something a little bit more diffident and self effacing about our culture. Um, that you don't always see elsewhere in the world. And I wonder whether that's been capitalized on by hucksters and charlatans and frauds, um, you know, people who people selling snake oil. And this is, this, you know, this, you've got to remember, this happens in every civilization in history. This is how the Roman Empire came to an end, you know. Um, this is how all great civilizations fall. I don't know whether this one can be saved, but I certainly hope to do my do a little part in arresting the decline. Um, social justice, I think, is a symptom of many things going wrong, many things being slightly sick with society, self-indulgence, the cult of the self, um, you know, all, all sorts of things that take that um, take root in sort of... in that sort of um, late capitalistic period of, of, you know, intricate symbiosis between government and, and private institution and everything sort of... and, and that incestuousness and the elitism of, of sort of... Late, late capitalism. Um, I, I think social justice is... Uh, we're at a point now where you're, we're either going to save America and save Western culture and, you know, stop admitting, you know, terrorists under the you know, banner of, like, oh, let's be nice and have all these immigrants and all the rest of it. Just stop 
admitting terrorists into your country. Stop taking people who don't want to pay taxes and be part of the system. Stop accepting people who are tearing off, you know, tearing down statues in universities from great thinkers, great, you know, great um, explorers and all the rest of it because they were straight white males. These insane people who want. I saw I saw a headline uh, as Seattle University. Seattle University um, students have demanded that they stop teaching English because there are too many straight white male uh, males on the curriculum. And they couldn't, you know, it wasn't good enough for them to go in and just be like, could we have more black female authors? Could we have more disabled authors? Could we have more paraplegic Syrian refugee authors? You know, that wasn't, a, they couldn't find enough literature good enough from anyone else. Um, they, you know, it was the straight white men that wrote all the best stuff. So they said, well, just close the subject then. That's obviously a sickness. And that's why I refer to it as one. And I hope that, I hope that we can save ourselves from, from, being consumed by it. I think we can. So I'd like to... Wow. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight to Social Justice is Cancer. I'd also like to thank Milo for being so incredibly entertaining and informative. Thank you so much. These guys, did, um, these guys did an amazing job. Sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to thank you because I don't know if you saw my entrance to Santa Barbara um, on the throne. I came in on a litter like Cleopatra, being held aloft by, by eight guys in Trump hats. And I didn't imagine that anybody would be able to, um, to upstage that entrance. But you have, with this a bit of theater, at least matched it. So thank you for all the hard work you did. Thank you for having me. Outside. I guess, I guess they really wanted to see him, huh? I, I, the virus. Okay. No, I'm not. I, I, I try not. I, you know, the, the police do an amazing job with these things. Um, I don't want to. Um, I would love to take you all out there, take a microphone and take these cameras and go and rip the piss out of them. And, you know, and I would love to go out there, even have a serious conversation with the guy and say, oh, the trash can go, Aah! No, 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 we shouldn't, we shouldn't laugh. We shouldn't laugh. She's obviously very troubled. She's obviously very troubled. <laughs> but so funny. So fun. I, I, I put it on a vine just for, purely for my own entity because I, I got tired of pressing play because I was watching on a loop on YouTube and I was getting sick of pressing play again. So I put it on a vine just like... <sighs> it's like watching the washing machine. You just can't take your eyes away. Anyway... We don't want we don't want to trigger we don't trigger we don't want to trigger any of that so we're, we're, I'm not going to do that but thank you for everything thank I guess. You You've been listening to the Milo Yiannopoulos Show, the podcast that launched a thousand therapy sessions for triggered snowflakes. Thanks for tuning in, and please do subscribe on iTunes, leave us a comment, a rating, whatever you like. Our producer is Tom Sicotta. Our researchers are Will Ross and Michael Poole. Our resident German, Mark Geppert, ensures the trains run on time. And our sound engineer, John Fitch, can be found at sturbridgesound.com. Download new episodes of the Milo Yiannopoulos Show at podcastone.com, and you can also listen to us at Breitbart. Stay tuned for 60-second AP News headlines. AP Update. I'm Diane Kepley. President Obama sits down this morning with presidential candidate Bernie Sanders. Our Mark Smith has more on the meeting. Aides insist the president isn't doing any arm twisting today and say Sanders, with his surprising and passionate campaign, has earned the right to exit the race on his own terms. Still, it's no secret Obama and other top Democrats want the sniping and squabbling to stop and Sanders to rally his backers behind Clinton. As for Clinton, she tells PBS she and Bernie Sanders are already working together. We are talking. Uh, we will be uh, having an opportunity to discuss in, in greater detail in the days ahead uh, how we can best work together. 
In a taping for The Tonight Show, the president says he thinks the campaign has made Hillary Clinton a stronger candidate. I thought that Bernie Sanders brought enormous energy and, and new ideas, and he, he pushed the party uh, and challenged them. I thought it made Hillary a better candidate. AP Update. I'm Diane Kaplay.